We're back with our fourth and final episode in the Mobility, Accessibility, and Design series. If you haven't checked out the first three, make sure to go back and listen to them after this episode. Today, we had such an amazing conversation with Sarah Hendren, artist, design researcher, writer, and professor at Olin College of Engineering. She eloquently shared her thoughts and experiences with art, design, and accessibility with us. We discuss many topics that come from her recent book, What Can a Body Do?, which we highly recommend reading, where she challenges the notion that disability is only a physical construct and rather a product of an inflexible built environment. And she really helped us challenge a lot of our own long-held notions and think a little differently. Welcome to Biomechanics on Our Minds. My name is Melissa Boswell. And I'm Hannah O'Day, and we're PhD students at Stanford University. This podcast is brought to you by the International Society of Biomechanics. It's, it's time, time for Boom. Boom. Welcome to Boom. We have Biomechanics on our minds. Boom. 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 Welcome back to Boom. We are so happy to be talking with Sarah Hendren today, who is an artist, design researcher, and professor of arts, humanities, and design at Olin College of Engineering, and the author of What Can a Body Do?, an amazing book that Melissa and I were lucky enough to read and are just so excited for you to be here today with us, Sarah. Um, We loved hearing you talk at the Reimagining Mobility series and are just so excited to have you share your experiences and stories with us. Thank you. So good to be here. So we really loved reading your book, What Can a Body Do? And we're so curious what first got you interested in mobility and assistance and asking the question, what can a body do? Yeah, it is like a, there's like a short, medium and long version of that story. (laughs) Um, I'll, I'll try to land it between the short and the medium. Um, broadly, I, uh, my background's in visual arts originally, and then worked in education research, went back to graduate school at UCLA, actually, in my late 20s, thought I was on the path to becoming an historian, and then dropped out of that program, actually, even after my dissertation research, because I was really longing to get back to making things. Mm. And um, in that same period where I was still kind of casting about for like, how am I going to make this go? Um, my husband and I decided to start a family. And the first of our three children, Graham was born and he has Down syndrome. So I was in this space of thinking like history, culture, artifacts, art making. And then I got ushered into the politics of disability. And in those early years of my son's life, I started going to OT sessions and PT sessions and speech sessions and um, seeing doctors and just as a person trained to think in terms of visual culture, I just started taking in all of the gear that he was using. So all of the little ankle braces and the tiny glasses that he got and um, all the toys in the kind of OT context that are meant to help a baby learn how to sit up, you know, stably or to um, begin to crawl or walk. And I just was so, my imagination was just so captured by the material culture of disability because of what it does functionally, but then also what it does symbolically, you know, like how it is that the stuff in our lives is also how we make sense of each other. So what we use is not just, not just getting the job done. It is also speaking to the world. And so that started a long time interest in both the urgency of disability politics, but also the creative setting of built artifacts, some of which are engineering, some of which are design, some of which are like in my training, artful, and especially when they do both or all of those things. And I started to sort of find um, artists who were working with technology or um, practices of what's called critical design. So design that also both poses a, you know, solution to a problem, sort of framed that way, and also asks a question at the same time. And then Again, long story short, I had three children. I went back to graduate school at uh, Harvard Graduate School of Design in kind of art design in the public domain, so public um, arts. And I landed at an engineering school, Olin College, which is outside Boston. And I sort of pitched my role to them as teaching assistive technologies and prosthetics, all that kind of material culture, for an engineering set of students. But from a kind of humanist perspective, what else can we do with the stuff that we build 
from the laboratory that is also a studio. So mm -hmm. that's kind of life and work how I got into the field. Yeah, it's really fascinating. Sometimes I think the things that happen in our life impact us in ways that we could have never imagined. And mm -hmm. I think sometimes, yes. you know, especially like as I'm going to grad school, I you know envision my life going in a certain direction or in a, studying a certain field. But it's pretty amazing how sometimes our experiences can totally shift that um, to somewhere new and just allow us to explore something different. It is really true, isn't it? And I think I, th I think actually part of the task of being a person is <laughs> to figure out the mix of what you plan for and choose together with the things that you don't plan for and didn't choose. So mm -hmm. can life be partly what you make happen and partly some of the things that happen to you? Like, can that all be a kind of compost for um, letting your life you know, both actively making your life and also letting your life become. I think that's actually a subtle work of a lifetime. Hmm. That's really beautiful. An another part of, of that that I liked was your use of the term artful. And I, I really love that you come from an art background and using engineering with that. Um, and then also your want to better understand how our we can work with our environment. Um, it's just, yeah, all of those together, I think, is is just such an interesting space. And your website says that your internal engine is built of questions, uh, the restless kind, the impractical, and the practical together. And so I was wondering if you yeah. could describe some of the restless questions that seem most important to you or, or for the field and mm -hmm. um, thinking about mobility and design right now. Yeah, thank you. Um restlessness is a, f a feature of, of my questions for sure. And it is a kind of uh, drive for me. Why? Because like a lot of people like to talk about like steam, like engineering and art, like what could, what could go wrong? Like, how could that be objectionable? You know what I mean? Like and people imagine that this is like a, like a kind of like uh pretty ifying of the STEM fields, you know, like as though somehow, you just make sculpture at the end. And so, because it's nice to look at, you know, <laughs> what, that all the domains are integrated. You know, like I find this really quite frustrating how shallow the understanding of, of this is. Mm -hmm. And so to answer your question, I'll tell you why. So the condition of disability is, is both a bio biological, sometimes biomedical uh, feature of the body, but it is also, also co-constructed with the features of the built world. And not only that, if it is mm -hmm. co-constructed with the features of the built world, if you can't get down the sidewalk into public space, then you can't get into the public sphere as a citizen. So you can't get to your job and the transportation and the education mm -hmm. and the voting booth that is your right as a democratic citizen. So it means that there, the barriers are there literally in the molecular structure of the, of the material mm -hmm. world, right? In the concrete, actually. Wow. And so what that means is that no one domain of research or policy or anything would suffice to actually organize a world around that interesting conundrum. That is to say, you do need better medicine and good caregiving and, and healthcare and also good engineering and technology to better bridge the gaps between the body and the world, right? And to, and mm -hmm. to shore up all its health and well-being. You do need that. But in order for disabled people to actually experience equality, you have to actually also provide ways of thinking together differently about each other, right? You have to counter things like stigma, paternalism, pity, exclusion, shame. So those are matters mm -hmm. that actually the sciences and technology don't touch. <laughs> I mean, mm -hmm. by definition, they don't. So yeah. this is yeah. where the arts and humanities and rhetoric and framing, right? Storytelling, popular culture, all of those fields, and then, of course, there's economics and policy and law, but all the fields of culture are the ones that help us ask the why questions and the big human questions of, like, what is the good life and what is normalcy and how would we recognize it if we saw it and what is a desirable future? Those are humanistic questions. The arts, um, the arts and humanities and the, those kind of rhetorical forms, those symbolic languages, those are helping us ask all the big questions 
why questions. Why are we here? Who are we to each other? What is a good life? All that. So mm. that is why for me, it has felt really important for, for, you know, to, for a condition of disability and a history of disability politics, which is so interesting and so varied, you need a, like, actually a lot of those disciplines brought to bear if you're trying to move a culture. And so to me, it's really important to be both in the, uh, you know, deep in the laboratory where I know lots of engineers are being trained because I do want to influence how they think about both the good use of technology and also it's very real limitations, mm -hmm. but also to try to demonstrate, you know, in a kind of just like in a disciplinary way, like all the ways that we could be working in between and among ways that we know, ways that we know things and, and ways that we use our time um, when we're trying to build the world that we want to see. That reframing and the language and um, sort of eloquence or eloquence with your language and precision with the words you use is like really amazing to me and just how um, you've clearly thought about all of these different things and how these all these different disciplines like interact. It's just yeah. amazing to see that sort of holistic vision. Well, it was really it was really hard one, though, I should say. I mean, I went back to graduate school. I finished the second time in graduate school at age 40 with three children. I mean, so in other words, that what looks to you like precision now is the benefit of hindsight of just being older. <laughs> you know, like <laughs> it's just looking back and going like, oh, when I dropped out of that PhD program, all my friends just thought I was a PhD dropout. You know, like they were just mm -hmm. kind of like, why, why would you do that? Like only a stupid person does that. <laughs> and so, and it felt at the time like lostness, you know, and then I was kind of underwater with having three kids in four years. And so like a lot of that time, I guess I just think whenever I'm talking to people in graduate school, I like to say, you know, that a lot of, a lot of moving forward feels like being lost. And then you cultivate a sense of knowingness over time about what it is that you're doing. And if you're somebody like me, who is like a constant in-betweener and who's felt a lot of times a little bit out of place, eventually that becomes a kind of voice. But at the t at the beginning, it just feels like, I don't belong. Like I must be yeah. in the wrong spot, you know? But so one of my big other passions is trying to broadcast to grad students, like just hang in there. Cause it, it starts to compound your perspective looking back, but only looking I'm, back. Yeah. I'm sure that's just so helpful for grad students to hear. And actually when you're talking about art and engineering and, and STEM versus um, steam, it, this, I was listening to a podcast with Neil deGrasse Tyson and someone asked the question, do engineers need art or where is the place for that? And I was not really happy with the response and that he thought his response was that, well, artists get, need engineers because they're inspired by the discoveries engineers make. But I don't really know why engineers would need artists. Right. And like I just like <laughs> felt in my heart like that cannot be true. And it makes right. me so sad. Right. Um, so I just right. love your framing of it. And I'm like, mm -hmm. ready to send this to him, like immediately. Yeah. After <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, I mean, here's the thing, right? Engineers, lots of not just engineers, lots of people think that they have a mental model of the arts as either a mirror, right? So artists are making things that are that reflect something that comes before, which is, you know, deeply held political or cultural values or ideas. Mm -hmm. So artists are making the mirror thing that just merely reflects this original thing, right? And, th and that this is the model that he's using, right? That So engineers are doing the kind of fundamental real work and artists sort of get inspired and make the reflection work. But, mm -hmm. Or another way, another mental model of putting it is like in a river, a linear river, you know, so like way upstream is like real knowledge, you know, and downstream is cultural knowledge because culture only flows downstream from those things. But this is what, so it's so funny how people are so unreflective about this. I mean, truly art is not for rich people in museums. I mean, every civilization, every global culture in every condition, including very poor subsistence farming, people have made artifacts, non-useful artifacts, built beautiful temples, you know, ancient temples to tell the stories of who we are, who we are to each other, to some notion of the divine, what happens when we die. All of those are human questions that people have never not been asking. I mean, never, ever. Like it's not, it's fundamental to how we understand civilization. Moreover, all the engineers, you know, spend all of their, you know, non-existence money 
and time on the arts. They watch TV, yeah. they read books and novels, they listen yeah. to music, they go to concerts. I mean, even if you just watch TV, you are you are engaging in like a fantasy story of made up characters. Why? Why should you follow them? Why should they? They're doing something for yeah. you. No one is holding a gun to your head and making you do that stuff. Try it. Try it. Try to go away without your music on your run, without your novel, without your magazines, without mm. like none of your Netflix. Try it. Nobody's very few people can do that for yeah. a week. That Why? Sounds- because because like, it is those other people's stories place us in our own story. They do this kind of reading of us. We think about our choices differently, watching characters move through time. It is quite strange, but there's no way in which you could say it's not necessary. It is. It's fundamental, you know, hmm. but people just have not mm-hmm. thought about it that way because we live in a culture where artists are thought to be, you know, kind of, uh, this very modernist notion of the artist who is this sort of singular genius and very misunderstood and probably emotionally, you know, troubled and all of those kind of stereotypes. And so we imagine that artists are not doing civic and creative work. We need what they do, but we can't imagine of them as people, right. Who have something to offer us. Mm-hmm. So. I think on the flip side of that too, like maybe as engineers, we often neglect or don't realize the impact that our engineering and that, that design can evoke, you know, emotions as you're saying, and That's like, right. That's um, right. yeah. change how, you know, change identity and meaning and create meaning in our culture. Yeah. And um, so it's important for us to like, think about that too. Like we can't say yes. that we're totally. <laughs> exactly. That. That's um, right. So in other words, you're saying technology is culture. So technology right. then also has material language in it, right? So if you make crutches, you know, with the language of the hospital bed about them, then people read that as a kind of hospital technology only. And I'm not saying you should go out and reinvent the crutch, but you should just be aware, right, that you are associating crutch use always with a medical condition that is in need of cure. And that's why people have forever, you know, designed and redesigned canes, for example, and have thought about other kinds of forms of the wheelchair. Why? Because that's not merely a functional technology. It never is. It has a material language and a logic that is also doing a symbolic work. It is also broadcasting some values. Now, again, that is not to say that it's all art and none of it matters. No, you want engineers to hew to the real pragmatic constraints of a technical thing, for sure. It's Mm -hmm. just as you say, engineers are not exempt from, and in fact are invited to, I mean, that's the thing, Mm -hmm. invited to actually Mm -hmm. think of what they make also as culture that is, that is non-neutral in the Mm -hmm. same way that, you know, data for an algorithm is not gathered in a neutral way. Technology also doesn't go out and with a neutral voice, it it participates in some kind of status quo or in asking questions. Hmm. I'm wondering if you have advice for how to like as an engineer or designer, how to sort of embrace that um, when, especially if, if maybe you're not used to thinking that way or you're not yeah. like you're, you're working very much within your technological constraints and not sort of, you know, yeah. stepping outside that if you have advice for that. Yeah. I mean, I think you can, you can fill your life with, um, with artifacts. So in a non-efficient way, so you can for pure joy on the weekend under non-pandemic conditions, Go to a museum and follow your natural curiosity to the, you know, Etruscan jewelry section and be thinking about like, how are these, how are these metals formed? And what is it like, why is it that they're so pleasing? Just at, so not like in a homework, eat your spinach way, but just like in a like, wow, I could be inspired by and nourished by all kinds of resources if I let my curiosity and my non-efficient brain give myself that as a form of like intellectual food and sustenance. That's one thing you can do. I mean, you can also, you know, pay close attention to artists who are working in the design and even fashion space and think, what is it that folks there are paying attention to that we're not over here in the laboratory? They are thinking about the housing over this joint. They are, what is it about, you know, just asking yourself a kind of reverse engineering question. Why is this powder coated in paint instead of finished in chrome? Like what's, when there are non-technical choices that can be made and even sometimes technical choices, why are people, and what, and then, and then ask yourself, what's the anatomy of the persuasive storytelling that's happening about this technology. So lots of times in prosthetics, the there's a rehab engineering story of a replacement part. That's not just replacing functionality. You'll often find 
those high tech limbs with a wedding ring, you know, attached. That is this kind of marker of identity. So just alert yourself. Not you should be skeptical and suspicious of it all the time, but just say, oh, that's a that's not just a technology. That's a technology that's coming at me in a story. Okay. What other stories are out there? You know? And here's again where mm-hmm. artists are some of your best guides. I mean, if you look at Carmen Papalia, who uses a cane to get around, but he has a very like vexed relationship to this cane. He thinks it brings him the help that he doesn't need and none of the help that he does need. And if you just ask artists to weigh into your process a little bit of the time, so let's say you're running an engineering laboratory, you just ask some artists who also are using gear to keep jolting you out of your normative frame and think like, so, Mm -hmm. so Carmen makes all this hilarious work about canes and he, he'll like work with a brass band to develop musical cues to tell him which way to turn in public space. Like just making a kind of like really absurdist way of doing wayfinding. And he's made canes that are like, absurdly long so long like they're that they obstruct other people's you know movement through public space so now he's like undoing all your categories about like this poor blind guy who needs a lot of help and shall i help him or not and wouldn't he really like a tricked out amazing cane and he's the joke's on you right like carmen's actually way out ahead of you on what it is that he is. <laughs> <laughs> that's again just ways to keep it just keeps your curiosity high and it just keeps your uncertainty productive and present where you go and then when you're making a decision in the lab you're just you just are drawing from a broader you know whole resource list of like ways to think about what's in front of me right ways to think maybe it doesn't make a difference about which circuit goes where i understand that those are very narrow technical questions but you do have some say over What's the story in which I am promising this technology will be meaningful? And have I thought through who are the characters and what's the protagonist? And what do I imagine is the before and after scenario attached to this? Because that is storytelling. So if you're paying attention to artists and the, the art that's in your life, and especially the, the, the art and the storytelling that's coming from the people from whom and with whom you're designing, then you're mm-hmm. just you're just more attentive, you know? Yeah. And I just yeah. think like... I mean, cities, some of the cities of the, of the world who've done the best work on planning and kind of equity choices have made these kind of laboratory environments in the urban planning department. So in Mexico City, Gabriela um, Gomez Mont, she ran this laboratory for the city. And it was like artists and engineers and urban planners all coming together to sort of say in this megalopolis of Mexico City, what's the city that we want to see? Okay, sometimes you're going to ask the artist to kind of take the lead. Sometimes it's the engineer, sometimes it's the urban planner. But if you're just kind of like involving yourself in efforts where other people's expertise can come to the fore, you'll do better work. You know, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. sometimes that means stuff you get paid for. And sometimes it's just citizen work. Like you volunteering on the school committee, you hanging out with your kind of city council people, just understanding where culture also comes to bear. Yeah, those are such good examples, too, of ways to seek out that inspiration versus, Mm -hmm. you know, just trying to find it in the workplace, too. Yeah, Um, Yeah. that's right. Yeah, I really appreciate that about your work is that you just really shift the view of what counts as engineering and who can be an engineer. And I saw your project called Engineering at Home, which you describe as an online design archive of adaptations um, built with... Cindy, who became a quadruple amputee late in life, and with her, you've created adaptations for all sort of all sorts of important physical functions like pulling and squeezing and even scratching. And um, yeah. you've done that from a lot of materials we have just around the house. And so I'm curious if you can talk a little bit more about um, the impact of engineering with people and with materials that we might not immediately think of as part of engineering or that process. Yes, right. This is another thing I'm really um, passionate about. And that is, so you're talking about Cindy, who is this quadruple, quadruple amputee. And Cindy has designed a bunch of things herself. So, so the archive that my uh, anthropologist colleague and I put together, Katrin Lynch is her name. It's none of the stuff, none of that is stuff that we built with Cindy. It's all stuff that she built herself or that with her family or with her prosthetist. And so, and none of it is a rejection of, of, you know, prosthetic science. I mean, in fact, there's amazing uh, artifacts there, but Cindy is interesting. And this is again, where the storytelling and the framing has, you know, the most kind of powerful um, Mm. 
sort of that that's the that the, the archive driven by story is the most what we hope is the is the most powerful contribution so Cindy qualified for an eighty thousand dollar myoelectric arm and went and got the training for it and got the insurance to approve it and like it has this incredibly privileged story within prosthetic rehab engineering but she doesn't use that arm ever I mean uh, it it is hot and heavy and cumbersome for her and meanwhile she has put together all kinds of really clever tools like a peel and stick hook that goes on a jar of cold cream or peanut butter to give her because she's missing most of the digits on both hands. So if you can picture like she doesn't have that kind of torque, like turning mechanism um, for opening a jar very easily, but peel and stick hook, she can now, you know, do this kind of household task that she wanted to do or like rubber edging, rubber tubing on an eyeliner so that she can put her eyeliner on. Mm. And, um, a whole, you know, a couple dozen things. And so a couple of the project the, as a project engineering at home, we were trying to do this curatorial work of saying this, these things that you think of as just detritus in Cindy's bag is actually doing this powerful prosthetic work. That's always being attached to the myoelectric arm. And more importantly, always being attached to the expertise of people with PhDs in engineering. Meanwhile, mm. there is this informal profound, dignified expertise that's happening for Cindy in her living room. <laughs> and the one doesn't mm -hmm. negate the other. You just need to build a big house in your mind about what counts as technology. It's, it's mm -hmm. really quite simple and yet so hard for people because Cindy doesn't register as like a maker type, you know. And the thing that Cindy has now is the kind of enfranchisement of the maker to say, Oh, I could ask for something else. I, you know, and that, of course, when engineers have that, that is really powerful because then they can also go mm. and build it. But actually, engineers can be just a subject to the limited imagination of saying it could be otherwise, it could be something else. So it was Cindy, for example, who went to her prosthetist after getting the arm and said, What I really want to do is write thank you notes in my own handwriting, which again, she doesn't have to do because she has a smartphone. It's very easy to speak into a smartphone and get text out. But because it was built on her wish to do that, she went to her prosthetist and said, I know surely something, we can do something. And the prosthetists, you know, who are, do, are these incredible little crafts people, I mean, in addition to sort of thinking medically together, built this little cap made of scraps of silicone in the back of the shop kind of deal that fits over her residual wow. um, limb. So it fits over the, what has, you know, the, again, mostly no digits on the, right side, cap of silicone, I'm talking under $10, outfitted with a ballpoint pen, and she moves it on paper every day, every day, and it is her handwriting. I mean, I just am like, wow, how do you even account for that? And again, it's not to romanticize the low tech, clever person who has to make everything for herself. Like I want those big systems too to produce those arms, which are transformative. And in my book, I talk, I walk people through mm -hmm a bunch of replacement prosthetic limbs, including those really high tech ones. And it's not, it's, it's a way we follow kind of five characters in that chapter to try to say, wow, technology is everywhere. People opt in, they also opt out, but pay attention to the body. Like instead of being so wowed by the technology and what it does or doesn't do, whether it's right or wrong, look at how amazing this human corpus is in all of its forms in mm -hmm. all of its forms. So when it's in an atypical form from the one you're used to, you don't have to think of that as a diminished form of human experience. You can think of it as a different form, which is also doing its adaptations. And then you can ask yourself, wow, well, if my body in changes and you know that it will, what will my choices be? And will I opt in or out? And will it be at the dollar store or at the laboratory? And how mm -hmm. will I know, right? That's a humanistic question. And so, Characters in books, nonfiction or fiction, are always offering us alternate paths, you know, so that we don't actually just, or we're not just reacting to life where we're saying like, oh, wait a minute, this is that moment. If I were Cindy, what would it, what would it be for me? Not because there's a right or wrong answer, but just I would want more options in my mind, you know, so we can think with our technologies in a more robust and creative way. Hmm. Wow. I feel like there was so much in that just... Um thinking about characters in a book and how they empower us to rethink all the different paths and um, yeah, just how adaptable we are. And like um, 
I really do think sometimes I think in higher education, I get stuck in this like, oh, well, you need these prerequisites to get to like this definition of check this box of what this means. Um, But I think it's so important also to recognize this other side that like, um, yeah, like this is just human. There's a lot of humanness about this, about this inventing and adapting and being flexible and, um, you know, being clever. Um, Yeah. And you, you know, when you widen your lens and you're just watching people doing their stuff all the time, then you ask better questions again, even if you're taking it back to a quite high tech Mm. laboratory, but the real designer's mindset is mostly a condition of antenna alert all the time. And the tape kind of always running where you're like, Whoa, Mm -hmm. what's going on there. And you're just like filing it away, you know, and Mm. I, you know, Cindy thought that Katrin and I were silly for thinking that we should collect these objects. She was like, no one is going to care. (laughs) And we kept going, no, no, this is really, it's quite extraordinary. Don't you understand? And again, the structure of the storytelling was like, everybody thinks that myoelectric arm is swooping in to rescue you. And you just came to our class with this big bag of the pen cap and the stick hook and everything. (laughs) And she kept going like, no, this is not, you know, but we were right. People are astonished by that. Why? Because it's it's very ordinarily human and inventive. And of course, people recognize and go like, oh my gosh, my grandfather was a tinkerer and made all this stuff. And <laughs> now there's just that part of their brain is lighting up because they're seeing Cindy and they're like, oh yeah, just because it's not MIT doesn't mean it's not, you know, inventive. So, right. And I think there's, you also highlight this other aspect that it's collaborative, right? It's not, yeah. we're not sort of doing this in isolation. Um, yeah. And I love that you end your book with like, which tools for assistance will we agree to owe to each other? Like that's sort of, that's a mindset in itself. Um, So I'm wondering Mm -hmm. sort of what this means for you and how do we create this culture that answers this question? We've talked about how we increase awareness and kind of bring stories into it and, um, you know, design for things like this. But just I'm just wondering what this means for you. Yeah, I mean, this is this is where design and technology of all kinds kind of uh, finds their hard limitations, which is to say, well, a couple of things, there is a role for design and technology in this, but I mean, uh, living in a culture in which assistance is not only permissible, but also a, 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 like a salutary part of life. And we know mm-hmm. that it is right. Our exchanges of giving and receiving help and care are actually some of the most grounding and connecting activities of our lives. I mean, we know mm-hmm. that we're hardwired for it. So why would we design it out? And here is the role for design and technology. So much, for example, of technology for aging is premised on an idea of maintaining independence above all else. This idea Mm -hmm. that if your need increases, that axiomatically your desirability of your life goes down, the quality of your life goes down. Mm -hmm. And I don't doubt that that is the case in some ways, but it's loneliness and depression in old age that are so troubling to design for. So why would we keep, why would we imagine that's a very engineers and young Mm -hmm. person's way of thinking about what aging must be like, and what is the best use of our tools. So this is what I mean, which tools for assistance will we agree to owe each other meaning, can we design actually the connections that return us to one another and that actually enhance our quality of life in the giving and receiving of help, the giving and receiving of help? And can we locate ourselves both in both subject positions. I mean, engineers have trouble uh, with uh, making peace with their own help. I think getting help, they like to be on the giving end. And the sooner we sort of say, I want to live actually in a future where we do agree to owe assistance to one another, not just in the form of extensions and tools, but I want to live in a city like I do with a sliding scale of, you know, after school programs. Why for assistance for parents? you know, including not rich parents. I want to organize uh, a collective world where help is part of what we think of what makes life worth living, not uh, hermetically sealing ourselves off from one another in the technologies that we build and not collapsing all our political hope onto each nuclear family. No, I want cities that thrive. I want school systems that serve a lot of kids. And Um, so that's where disability actually does its most profound work because it's really knocking at the foundations of individualism. You know, it is really saying disability is this kind of 
personal and political needfulness that is saying, you're here too. Don't you want a world in which needs are okay? You do, you know, if you're honest about it. Hmm. Okay. What does that mean for how you vote, how you spend your time, where you volunteer, maybe what you do with your job. But again, even fixating on like, what's the best way to use my time and my work is a very a logic of the market, right? It is this idea that like your your whole self is wrapped up in what you economically produce, you know, as a tax bank yeah. citizen, rather than thinking of your life yeah. in the wholeness of its many ecologies of care. So, and again, yeah. here's where I, I mean, I want to live in a place where with the after school programs, that's not a technological question. That's a policy question. So it, it yeah. designers and engineers also need to just be aware of the, the hard limits, like the moment at which okay, this is, this has ceased to become a technological or design issue. This is actually a policy issue. It exceeds those bounds. Mm. Yeah. And I think the example that you give is just so perfect for that in terms of aging. And it's like, Mm -hmm. you know, rather than, you know, maybe I guess I, I think of an older person and, you know, the need to go out and get groceries and then a technological advance would be, oh, we deliver all the groceries to you. So you don't even have to leave your house, but maybe, right. but then, you know, you're missing all of those social interactions. Maybe those are the things mm. that you like. You like to leave your house and walk around the shops and That's you know, right. just having that other perspective of what you're saying, you know, what is helping and we don't want to design help out of our society. That's right. And if we're taking that kind of that uh, an anthropological approach, then we're saying, you know, maybe people do want the groceries delivered, maybe they don't, but we would know only if we were to look closely at people's behavior and expand our metrics for what the good life is, you know? So it's not just mm-hmm. about X amount of locomotion and, you know, walking gait. It's also meaning, purpose, connection, value, right? Mm-hmm. Um, self-reported uh, life satisfaction. I mean, the stuff we live for, after all. So then how do we identify that, see it where it's already happening, assume that people are already adapting, inventing, doing all kinds of amazing stuff already, and then seeing what the role for designer tech might be. Hmm. Yeah, thank you so much. I think that that will be really powerful for people to hear and and mm-hmm. start thinking about those new questions. Um, before we ask our last question, we wanted to ask how people can learn more about you and your work. I'm sure they're feeling very inspired listening to this. And um, if they wanted to continue to, to learn more, what's the best way to do that? Yeah, I, um, I mean, I wrote the book to be, it's not an academic book. It is a trade book. And I wrote it uh, and kept it short enough that I really wanted it to be that kind of gesture of beginner translation and to say, this is not really, I really am mostly a reporter in that book, just saying like, here's a bunch of people that we meet in their homes and their contexts. And also here's a lively creative tradition um, of disabled people themselves writing, designing their own worlds. And I'm kind of an observer just pointing you to those sources and kind of like mm-hmm. the beginner's mind for that. So it is the way to begin, I think. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I do have a website, sarahendron.com, and I do have an occasional newsletter musings here and there. But um, really, I did try to make the book to be a kind of paper trail to other people's work that have inspired me so much and 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 have their own, you know, whole their own websites, their own projects, their own, my hope is that you find it a kind of, you know, refracting mirror to, to other kinds of sources. Yeah, absolutely. And I, and you said that it's a non-academic book, but I know for sure that it's pretty much impossible to read the book without it impacting your academic work or your engineering (laughs) work. So (laughs) I'm glad. I mean, I, it is it is meant to try to translate some of the theoretical into everyday speech. So, you know, and the paper trail again. For our last question, we're just curious what you're most excited about then for the future of mobility or assistance. Yeah, I mean, one of the things I'm most excited about is um, one of the kinds of conditions that's hardest to design with in mind, and that is cognitive and developmental disability. Partly this Mm -hmm. is because um, I have a son with Down syndrome. So I'm thinking a lot and Mm -hmm. a number of autistic family members and nieces and nephews and so on. So I'm thinking a lot about that because it's not about literal mobility and it's not about Mm -hmm. literal kind of sensory capacity. So I am paying really close attention to things like social enterprise for job development. I'm paying close attention to 
self-defense classes that are being taught to young people to keep them mm. safe and independent on the bus and the subway. Um, mm. I'm paying close attention to creative housing kind of in that realm. And I'm thinking a lot about the uh, really creative designs for blended college curriculum that makes secondary education um, more accessible to people. So uh, like a couple of places here in Boston that blend life skills and kind of coaching for independent, you know, mm-hmm. um, self-care and so on together with academic work and, and job training. I just think there's a kind of spirit of invention around college in that way, because again, it's just a, it's a, it's a more interestingly um, non-technical kind of space, but it takes all that creativity of design. So I, so in that way, I'm thinking about mobility that is um, social, you know, the, the mobility of belonging in public for a population that, you know, just a couple of generations ago would have been routinely institutionalized, you know, very much cordoned out of the public sphere. So what does it mean to make a public sphere for a lot of different kinds of neurocognitive conditions? Wow. I can say for sure those are answers we've never had to that question. We asked that question to everyone. And I love how integrated your answers are with like the real world. Not that the others haven't been, but your perspectives and comments have sort of like tickled our curiosities and just really challenged our conventional lines of thought I think so thank you so much for for sharing all of your experiences and perspectives with us today thank you I mean I do this work because I'm so inspired by technical people people way more technical than me and I (laughs) um so it's a joy to interact over this stuff thank you so much thank you for listening to biomechanics on our minds I'm Hannah. And I'm Melissa. Thanks to the International Society of Biomechanics for supporting the podcast and to Peter Washington for creating all the music you hear on Boom. Make sure to follow us on Twitter at BiomechanicsOOM and on Instagram and Facebook at Biomechanics on Our Minds. If you have feedback, suggestions for guests, want to share new biomechanics research or research fail, want to host your own episode or be involved in the making of Boom, or just say hi, you can reach out to us at any of our social media platforms or send us an email at biomechanicsonourminds at gmail.com. Biomechanics off our minds.